All right, we have a fantastic and amazing group with us here right now. So welcome to our Weavers of Orlando. Our first weaver that we'll be speaking today is Karen Slongwhite Green. She first started down the fiber arts rabbit hole more than 25 years ago when she taught herself to knit out of a book. She now knits, crochets, spins, weaves, dyes, and sews with varying degrees of skill and devotion. She occasionally blogs about fiber arts at yarnycurtain.com. Karen is, an active, is active in local fiber arts organizations, currently serving as the president of Orlando Distaff Day, the technology chair of the Florida Tropical Weavers Guild, and the historian of the Weavers of Orlando. She is part of the Weavers of Orlando demonstration team, which usually does at least one in-person demonstration per month at schools, museums, art shows, festivals, or fairs, and looks forward to the day when we can resume in-person demonstrations. Our second speaker is Jennifer Williams. She has a lifelong passion for fiber arts and is an inkle band weaver and basket weaver for over 10 years. Jennifer teaches at local weaving guilds and weaving conferences. Our third speaker is Constance Blackmon Lee. She is an award-winning costume designer and fiber artist. She has been an artist from coast to coast for many years. Now she resides in Orlando with her daughter who is also a costume designer and artist. Okay, good morning, everybody. I am so happy that you are all here and I'm happy to be here also. I am speaking today about cotton and... I all right, so cotton, the thread that binds us together. Okay, sorry. This, all right, so silk on the left, These the this is the cocoons and then this is ready to spin. This is flax ready to be spun into linen. This is wool that's not yet washed. This is just sheared off the sheep, but not prepared in any other way. This is wool that is ready to spin. And this is cotton on the seed. And this is a cotton puny that's ready to spin. Um, these fibers all represent a level of agriculture and cultivation in order to, uh, these are the four fibers that have been used to make cloth for a very, very long time. But of these, cotton is the only one that has, indelibly changed our world and technology in, and so that's going to be our focus today. Cotton is also integral to the founding of the Weavers of Orlando. Uh, um, this here is a cotton bull weevil. I know it's such a pretty thing to look at. In the early part of the 20th century, this insect destroyed cotton production in the United States. It took a while and there was a eradication program that went on for, for a couple of decades. But by the early 1940s, um, Florida had decided that they wanted to try and promote cotton growing in the state again. And to that end, they, uh, part of what they did is they hired three women who were responsible, one for the north part of the state, one for the central part of the state, and one for the south part of the state for education around cotton, in particular, Sea Island cotton. Viva Carr was the representative for Central Florida, and here she's pictured weaving at a display at the 1942 State Fair in Tampa. This was part of her educational efforts, and she actually wove 42 items from Sea Island cotton that there were also displayed during this fair, and I don't have a picture of the display. I thought I did, but I couldn't find it. One of the other things that she did was she started teaching weaving classes in Orlando and in Tavares where she lived um, and in a couple of other places in Central Florida. The Weavers of Orlando Guild was eventually founded by people who were attend by Viva and her students who were attending weaving classes in Orlando. So, um, and, and that same group of people also founded this Florida Tropical Weavers Guild, which is the statewide guild. So weavers of Orlando cannot be separated from cotton. This world map, the two lines of latitude here is 37 degrees north and 30 degrees south. Cotton grows within these boundaries. You can grow it a little bit further north if you grow it as an annual, um, but the commercial production basically takes place within these two lines of latitude. Cotton requires a long growing season, 160 to 215 days from the time you plant the seed until the time the harvest is finished. 
during the first three to four months of growth requires a great deal of water, about four inches of rain per month. And after that three to four months is when you can start the harvest. Um, cotton will produce on a continual basis. So harvest can continue for, um, for up to 100 days after the first cotton is ready. It can be pretty fragile to wind. So wind will knock the plants down. And um, while cotton can be, some varieties of cotton can be a perennial, it is generally grown as an annual in order to help uh, control pet for pests and diseases. There are four, there are 50 varieties of cotton more than 50 varieties of cotton, but they all fall into four families, which are here. And what I have done is highlighted the modern day countries where the, the, the various types of cotton originated. And all of the different varieties that exist now are subspecies of one of these four species listed here. And the various subspecies are, are they, can be are vary based on whether they're frost tolerant, drought resistant, whether they can tolerate saltwater intrusion, which is important in coastal growing areas. Um, but the but they are native to the four areas here shown on the map. And currently, commercial production is ninety percent the her. I don't know how to say this Latin words hirsutum. Um, which is the American upland cotton, which is indigenous to Mexico, the Caribbean, and South Florida. And the Barbadans, which is uh, native to South America, includes things like sea island cotton and Egyptian cotton and Pima cotton, which are the longer, uh, longer fiber lengths. Um, On this map, you can see the two earliest evidence of, of cotton cultivation. Now, it is very challenging with textiles because they degrade, they rot, and so very few textiles survive in archaeology. In addition, there are, it, 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 so it's very specific climate conditions, low oxygen, either very dry conditions, like for example, in Egypt, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of textiles that have survived because it's so arid. And another place where uh, textiles are sometimes found is in low oxygen conditions, like a peat bog, for example. And so those conditions don't occur everywhere in the world. Plus there's a problem of where archeology span happens isn't consistent across the globe. And so um, these are right now, the two oldest locations of confirmed cultivation of cotton, one in India and one in Peru. And uh, uh, there's some evidence, there's definite evidence of cotton cultivation in Mexico, but the dates are disputed somewhere between 5000 BCE and 2500 BCE. And in the Middle East and Northern Africa region, um, there's confirmed cultivation of cotton at about 2500 BCE. But in all of these cases, what we're able to confirm shows that there's already the existence of highly developed technology in terms of spinning and weaving. So there's already a high level of skill in these places, and we do not know how long cultivation and uh, textile creation had been, cotton textile creation had been happening. To that end, this uh, particular textile is from approximately 3500 BCE. It's the oldest cotton fragment to have been dyed with indigo. And this particular piece is twined, but there were six different fragments found at this site dated to about the same age. And some of and about and half of them were twined and half of them were woven. And so it's, it, you know, at this point it's pretty faded, but you can see like these strands here and here that are blue, um, but faded. And so this 
already shows a very high level of skill in terms of dyeing because indigo is not an easy thing to work with. And it is also showing advanced creation of the textile. Um, slide is not showing, but this, so this next slide is focused on India and it's a map that shows India and uh, parts of Asia, Africa and Europe. And it is showing the trade that was happening in bet uh, between these various areas. And it's a map from the 13th century. Um, oh. Uh, can you see that now? So what's happening here in this um, slide is that each of these areas represents a trade route. So each bubble, each circle, and this is 13th century. What this is showing is that there was already complex levels of trade happening. The numbers that are on here are not are only there so you can I can talk about bubble number one. They are not identifying like an order, um, so it's not like it's a circle that things are going from one to two to three or anything like that. It's just so we can talk about bubble one. But the important thing to see about this is that trade might be happening between like Beijing and Malacca. The in, uh, that's the north and south ends of the bubble number one. And then trade is happening between Malacca and Calicut or one of the other cities that's over there on the north. So products that were being woven and created in India were, would travel you know, through a series of intermediaries and were going all around the world. By the time of this map in the medieval and early modern worlds, cotton textiles were probably the most traded commodity in the world. There is evidence that, uh, documentary evidence, because textiles as old do not exist anymore, but documents do, that reveals context between Mesopotamia and India before 2000 BCE and obtaining goods between the Mediterranean and India as far back as that although uh, probably on a system like this where it was going through multiple intermediaries. Ancient Greece uh, writings mention in India wool that grows on trees and by the first and second century uh, CE, a book for Greek merchants cites the availability of quote, much cheap cotton goods, all kinds of linen and finer cotton being produced in India. Indian cotton was sold to China no later than the first and second century CE. Um, by the seventh to 10th century CE, Chinese documents, documentary sources regularly mention in Indian muslin that's available in China. So, the, so the, to get, the important thing to get out of this slide is there was already complex systems of trading and textiles were being traded all over the world by this time period, which is the 13th century. And the other thing I wanted to mention about this is that because of this, Indian traders um, specialized and were responsive to the market. And I just lost my The reason that Indian textiles were so popular is because there was a wide variety of them and they were also master dyers. The textiles here in this image are a range in age from the 10th to 15th century CE. And these are all very advanced dye techniques. In all of these textiles, the tan color is the woven material, the other colors are dye. And to get these patterns, it's uh, they're doing resist dyeing, which means they apply something to the fabric that the dye won't stick to, and then they dye it and then they wash out the resist. So you're left with the negative spaces that aren't dyed. So some of these are probably hand painted, like something like this, maybe it's hand painted. Some of it is block print. So where this pattern is engraved onto wood and then the resist is printed onto the fabric and then the fabric is dyed. So these are all, uh, and all of these pieces, 
come out of, come from archaeological digs in Egypt. So they're dated, they're created in India and uh, sold through some system to Egypt. And these all date between the 10th and 15th centuries. This is a few more examples. Um, the two on the left are also Egyptian in the 15th century range. And the one on the right is 15th century, but up from India itself. And you can see is much more complex in design. This piece is, uh, this one is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This one is also a 15th century piece, um, 15th to 16th century in India. And you can see this one has a, is a number of complex techniques where you have painting. The gold is, I believe, actual gold. Um, this, there's some of this is ink inside of these squares is hand write, written uh, text from the Quran. And this dot, this uh, object, this jacket has the entire text of the Quran on it between the front and the back in all of these little squares. So this is printing and writing and painting all in one um, object. I'm going to go quickly through how these textiles are created um, and the techniques that were in use at the time. This is a modern picture from 2005, but this is hand picking cotton in India. Hand picking cotton has looked the same no matter when it is that you uh, were picking it. These, uh, there's several prints here. These are uh, eight, 19th century prints, about 1830 to 1850. But these are demonstrating the process of, uh, of creating cotton textiles. Here, they're ginning the cotton to remove the seeds. A gin of this type probably came into use no later than the early 16th century which means it predates Eli Whitney's cotton gin um, by a couple hundred years. Prior to this, they were using a roller gin in India, which is basically a, a slab of wood or a stone. And then you use a rod kind of and use it sort of like a rolling pin. So you like push over the cotton and the seeds in order to separate it out. And something like that was in use probably by about 500 CE. In these images, they're bowing the cotton. And so, uh, you know, this was done in both India and China and has been done for a long, long time. So the way this works is you see uh, uh, in, the, in the right hand, they're holding some sort of device in the left hand, holding the pole of the bow. And with the right, the object in the right hand, you strum it and it picks up the uh, cotton and it helps to take out any debris that's left after ginning. In this picture, they are spinning the woman on the left with a spindle and the woman on the right with a charka spinning wheel. Now, there's a great deal of dispute about when spin wheels, spinning wheels were first invented, who they invented them and where. Um, and it ranges anywhere from like about 500 to 1000 CE and Middle East, India, China, all as possible locations. But what we do know for sure is these are all 13th century images. The one on the left is from China. The one on, in the middle is from Iraq and the one on the right is from France. And so these are all medieval images of spinning wheels in use and they are all variations on the same style of spinning wheel which is a spindle wheel. This is a, one of the spinning wheels that Gandhi spun on. And you can see here, when I say a spinning wheel, a, a spindle wheel, this over here on the bottom right of the image is a spindle. The wheel is turned by hand in all of these spindle wheels, regardless of the configuration or whether they were on the ground or upright or whatever, you turn the wheel by hand and you have to manually wrap the yarn around the spindle as it's spun in, in order to spin the next part. And finally is weaving. And in this um, 
picture, this is India and he, they're sitting on the ground to weave. This is um, one common form of a loom. This is a multi-harness loom. There's two heddles here. And so this is a loom that you would use to weave plain weave on most likely. And then the woman who's spinning over here, um, she's this, this already looks like there's cotton on it. And it's not clear to me which direction she's going here, if she's plying or if, if she is reeling off of her spindle onto onto here. So um, anyways, but that is the full process of creating the textiles. And this is what uh, textile creation looks like in India for many millennia and centuries um, up to including into the 19th century. And finally, uh, this is just some statistics on how long it take would take to get from a pit from harvest to finished thread. And I wanted to point out here the 100 pounds of bowls results in eight pounds of usable cotton. You're, you're losing weight all along the way. A big part of that is the seeds. The seeds weigh about 10 times as much as the cotton does. So when you're picking 100 bowls, it still has the seeds in it. But also on each, each time you do a process, there's some pieces of fluff that just aren't, they aren't long enough or whatever and they don't make it through. So in terms of production, cotton was the is the longest in terms of how long it takes to process from harvest to finished thread. Questions? Anybody? And okay. people can also ask questions in the chat and I can read them out or they can unmute themselves and ask questions as well. There's no questions. I guess we can go to Jennifer. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I thank you for coming and listening to my presentation, Stronger Together, Connected Through Cotton. The idea that all, we all have cotton somewhere in our lives. And through that concept, we are therefore connected. I would like you to take a moment and look around the room that you're sitting in, look at the clothing that you're wearing. And I bet if you do that, your eyes saw something that had cotton in it. As most everything that in our world has cotton, cotton is in our daily lives in ways that we can, we don't even think about. For most of us, our relationship with cotton begins at birth and is constant. If you take a pic, look at this screen here, we have obviously clothing and house linens, but cotton, because of the seed, the oil that can be extracted, can, is part of soap making. It's part of plastic um, manufacturing, even um, television screens. For the hulls of the, after the, the cotton is picked and the, the hard hulls are ground and fed to cattle. The, the, the woody stems from the plant are also ground after harvesting and used in paper and cardboard construction. I have a love of cotton that borders on obsession, <laughs> but my true affinity for cotton began, I would say, when we moved from Massachusetts to Florida and I retired my cold weather clothes for warm, cool cotton t-shirts and shorts. My awareness grew of my, my, oh, my affinity for cotton further grew when I became a weaver. Of all of the fibers to use to make cloth, my choice is always cotton. In the time um, between moving to Florida and learning to weave, I became conscious that wearing cotton and weaving with cotton was a choice and because it was in stark juxtaposition to my unknown ancestors who toiled in bondage to cultivate the crop that I so freely interact with daily. My emotional connection to cotton began a few years ago. And I say my emotional com connection to cotton as opposed to my comfort or my creative connection. I was on a field trip with my children at a botanical garden and the garden had a cotton plant. 
the guide pulled a piece of a, a, a bowl of cotton from the pod and asked if anyone wanted to hold it. Having never held a piece of cotton, I was very excited to do so. Unexpectedly, the moment the cotton touched my hand, tears touched my eyes. In that moment, I was wholly connected to my ancestors, suffering, pain, fears, hopes, and dreams. That experience made me start thinking about ancestry and memory and doing some research. And I came al along the concept of ancestral memory, where past memories and traumas are passed from generation to generation. Experience, so experiences that happened three generations ago are genetically encoded on our, our, your, your future generations. Research for this has not yet gone been done extensively in humans, but they have seen this shown again and again in organisms and animals, even plants, crazy enough. Um, there's a plant that a mimosa plant that when it is sensing danger, it closes its leaves. The study was done. If they dropped the plant, would the leaves close? They did. They repeated this study, this the dropping of the, the plant five times and then more. And what they found was after a time, the plant realized, I'm using human terms towards a plant, but the plant realized that it was not going to be in danger from being dropped and it stopped closing. And then further plants that were grown from the, the mother plant also, did not close once dropped. I came across this quote, water overflows with memory, emotional memory, bodily memory, sacred memory. And I think of cotton, the fiber of cotton, the same way as the water. For me, it's overflowing with memory, emotional memory, bodily memory, and sacred memory. But it's important to have these memories because healing occurs in recognizing ancestral memory because the past shapes the present and our way forward. Cotton and American slavery. There is not enough time here today in this presentation to talk about all of the aspects of American history of cotton. However, discussing connections through cotton in America would be incomplete and inappropriate discussion without it. We are all connected to this story because it is our story. This image that you're looking at, um, it's always hard to see, but it's a bill of sale for a man, a person, a man called, and I did not say named because we don't know what his name was. This is what someone chose to call him, but called Old, old, old Ned for $11 in 1818. This image is an artistic rendering by an unknown artist of a slave ship, the hull of a slave ship, transporting enslaved, captured and enslaved people. Over 400 years ago, ships carrying stolen lives traveled what is known as the transatlantic slave road and arrived here in the United States, eventually leading to a system that enslaved millions of people for over 200 years. This system was the backbone of our cotton industry. People were treated as property, no different than a garden tool, chair, or bacon, as illustrated in the property appraisal for a plantation from 1852. This had this a property appraisal on it had um, chairs. It had sheep, it had a cotton gin, but it also listed 42 people as though they were things. What is unique about this property appraisal is that it actually lists the names of the enslaved people. So many times when you come across um, property lists from plantations, they do not list the enslaved by name. Often they are listed as one boy, one girl, 15 slaves. 
So it is powerful to be able to see names, assigned names um, on a property appraisal. In the first year of his presidency, George Washington wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson that the increase of that new material cotton must be of almost infinite consequence to the prosperity of the United States. That was a very prophetic and profound statement because for another, for almost another hundred years, that was the case. Too much, not enough. Historical documents indicate that enslaved laborers were expected to pick approximately 250 pounds of cotton a day. So for perspective, and I know Karen talked about how laborious it was, it is to pick cotton and process cotton. Um, one, it takes approximately 200 to 400 bowls of cotton to equal one pound. One acre of cotton has approximately 13,700 bowls of cotton. To equal that, to, that 250 pounds of cotton, it takes about 58,000 bowls of cotton. That's almost three acres of cotton, three acres of ground that they had to cover in a day. But the catch-22 of the too much, not enough, was they were given quotas every day. If you met your quota, okay, but if you didn't meet your quota, you were severely punished. If you went above your, your quota, your quota for the next day could be adjusted, and then you were expected to be able to pick more and faster. All aspects of enslavement were regulated down to the clothing that people were allowed to wear. I'd like to read a portion of this for you. Um, and whereas many of the slaves in this province wear clothes much above the condition of slaves for the procuring whereof they use sinister and evil methods, such as having the audacity to try to escape, for the prevention, therefore, of such practices for the future, be it enacted by authority aforesaid that no owner of prop, of, sorry, no owner or proprietor of any Negro slave or other slave, except livery men and boys, shall permit or suffer such Negro or, or other slave to have or wear any sort of apparel whatsoever, finer, other or greater value than Negro cloth. Negro cloth. So what that act of 1773 said, in essence was, the, the portion I didn't share was that it was the law that all plantation owners were responsible for supplying the basic needs, basic, a very, very loose term, basic needs of their enslaved. They must feed them, clothe them, and house them. But they also regulated the, what that clothing was. It couldn't be too fine. There, it, it gave you your class, your status, but it also was a way to um, if, to hunt down someone if they escaped. Um, in notices, you would find the description of their clothing. It also, if, if, if it were a time that there were also free enslaved people, the, you could not disguise yourself as a free person. It, it was a way to regulate your status beyond being enslaved. The interesting thing about Negro cloth is that the the enslaved people often, depending on the plantation and the size, were responsible for their own cloth. So they had to grow the cotton, spin the cotton, pick the cotton, spin the cotton, process the cotton, spin the cotton, weave the cotton into their own clothing. Or they might have been given an allotment of fabric or ready-made clothes. And so this image is an example of uh, handmade uh, clothing for an enslaved person, which is a very rare find because cloth does disintegrate. And because they were not, they were given, if they were given clothing, they were given two outfits, usually, generally, or a very small amount of yardage to make clothing, so nothing really lasted. The other interesting thing about the cotton 
is that often the cotton that um, the enslaved were given to grow for themselves and for their own clothing was brown cotton. So here you see an image of naturally growing brown cotton, which is just gorgeous. The reason they were given the naturally brown cotton was so that they would not be able to cultivate it and profit from sales of it because it was less desirable than the white cotton. So again, just the fiber in the plant itself is another way to regulate the status of an enslaved person. Lord of the Lash and Lord of the Loom. Eventually, after the implementation of the, the invention of the, uh, the cotton gin by Eli Whitney, production of cotton skyrocketed, which also meant more enslaved people, which meant more clothing of more enslaved people, but less time and less need to um, produce the cotton in-house in, in plantations. So an entire industry grew out of Negro cloth. In particular, Rhode Island was a hotspot for this. Um, mills, the mills produced um, inexpensive, coarse, cotton woolen material made specifically for plantations. The cloth, cloth was cheap and durable. So it, they would ex get the yardage and it would last longer than things that, they, that, was, that were homespun. Rhode Island was a major player between 1800 and 1860. 1660 Negro cloth mills opened. At a point in the mid late 1800s, 79% of all mills in Rhode Island were exclusively, exclusively producing Negro cloth. This relationship in the North with the slave economy in the South led to the phrase, the Lord of the Lash, which would be the plantation owners in the South, and the Lord of the Loom that depended on their their being, their existence on the plantation system of the South. Slave cloth is also known as Osnaburg, is a, a plain weave, coarsely woven textile. A hope for better. After emancipation in 1865, plantation owners still needed labor. The plantation still existed. So a system called sharecropping was in, introduced. No longer enslaved, freed black men would rent, and that's in quotes, land from landowners to grow cotton or other crops in exchange for a portion of the profits after harvest. Sharecroppers often got all supplies to work the land from the landowner. And often at the end of the season, the harvesting season, owed more than they made thus barely seeing a profit or not a profit at all. So the idea that the land was rented is actually, a, it's a, a misnomer because they were given a piece of land in exchange for the promise of profit after the harvest of the crop. However, because of the, it's the, the stipulations that were put into place in their contracts, often that never occurred. So really it ended up being working for, for, for nothing under the guise of working for yourself. Additionally, landowners often required work term contracts and required other work on overall plantations. I read a quote where a plantation owner said that things before anything could be deemed finished, he needed to approve it. So, he could decide, nope, that's not good enough. And then it has to be done again to the detriment of even being able to grow your own cotton to then be able to harvest and profit from. While sharecropping did offer a level of autonomy that never was experienced under slavery, freedom in this sense was a relative term. Because in addition, there were white sharecroppers. So the freed and slave people were now competing for profits with the white sharecroppers, which was also not encouraged or enjoyed. So what is an ancestor? Because they talked about ancestral memory. For the idea of connections through cotton, 
I think of ancestry as genetic, someone that you're related to, mother, father, grandmother, aunts, second aunts, cousins twice removed. But I also think of it as cultural in terms of our history. History is a cultural ancestor that we live with all the time. How we interact with it and digest it and process it and move forward is one thing, but it is a cultural ancestor. So genetics, the genetic ancestor is a personal where a cultural ancestor, our history is shared because it is our history. Viewing cotton through the lens of shared history, the cultural inherited and ancestral memory of our country and all of its complexities and storied ugliness, belonging to all of us shows that, are we, that we are connected to each other and to the past. Healing exists in memory because the past shapes the present and our orientation to the future. For my part of my journey in healing and connecting with my ancestors, I, we are taught a narrative that we, there's, there were slaves in America, black slaves. There's no mention of what they were before or what they were individually during the time of slavery. So in a reframe, I recognize that my ancestors brought over from the continent of Africa were spinners and weavers and dyers prior to coming to this nation. They brought knowledge with them that was then exploited. So for me, the connection to cotton and learning to weave it and learning to spin it is part of that healing process. To quote Maya Angelou, when we know better, we do better. But I would like to add to Miss Maya Angelou, but to do better, we must know. And so our connection through our history and knowing and learning it is what allows us to know. Thank you. Are there Thank you very Thank much, you very Jennifer. Much. We'll also, after um, Constance's presentation, have a longer question and answer period. If people want to think about, because this was a lot of emotional information and history and hard things to think about. So thank you. All right, uh, uh, Constance, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Hello, everyone. I'm Constance Blackman Lee. And today I'm going to take you for a ride on the Underground Railroad using a secret code in a quilt made of that very cotton, 100% cotton that Jennifer talked about and Karen talked about. I'm going to show you a quilt that has codes as a map for runaway slaves to freedom in the north. And this quilt behind me is the quilt that I made out of 100% cotton. Now I'm going to present, present some facts and some evidence that each of these blocks were used as a code made out of that very cotton for more than 200,000 slaves to, to run away to the north for freedom. So I want to show you. And at the end, I want you to make up your mind whether this is fact or fabrication, whether I presented enough evidence, because there's a lot of controversy that they did not use quilts in order to read these codes. But I want you to make up your mind at the end. What do you think? So I'm going to. I want to, can you see that? This quilt that I made out of 100% cotton has 16 blocks. I'm only gonna point out two. I'm not gonna go through this whole quilt because this is part of the presentation as I tend patients. But I want you to take note of this one in the corner here. This is called the Jacob's Ladder. And now this, this block represents the entire rail, the Underground Railroad. Uh, I want you to take note of this one here on the bottom. This is the story of the Underground Railroad. 
So let's proceed. So let's just take a quick look. We moved it around to take a look at that. The cord is exactly 68 inches by 68 inches. And I want to take a moment to thank Karen Green, our very first speaker. Uh, stopped by her house and she had a bin of she donated all of these fabulous colors, fabulous uh, fabrics that I went through, pulled out some and made this quilt for this presentation. So the cotton has come from her hand down to my hand and someone gave it to her, she said. So we're still passing along scraps and pieces of fabric. So cotton is still on the move. I guess cotton is still King. Let's start the presentation. Okay. This is the quilt that I showed to you. And I want you to take a better look at this block. It kind of looks like a railroad. And this block is the story of the underground. Uh, railroad. Let's go to the next one. Now the story begins here. There's been a lot of controversy about whether the, there were secret codes down in the blocks and how was it used in order for slaves to read it, to go to the North for freedom. There was a book that came out in 1994 by a woman, uh, Jacqueline Tobin, and a man, a professor at, uh, what's the name of the university? He was at Howard University in DC, Raymond G. DeBard. And the story, to tell you this quick story, Tobin went to South Carolina to buy straw baskets. At that famous marketplace, while she was buying the, looking at the baskets, she noticed in the back, this woman here sitting in a chair holding a quilt. She was surrounded by quilts. Her name is Mrs. Ozella McDaniel Williams. She has, is a regular, she's a staple in the Charleston marketplace with her quilts. She said she went over and asked her about the quilts. And the lady politely got up and said, do you see this quilt? She said, this quilt is the, is the coded quilt for the Underground Railroad. She said she didn't understand what she was trying to tell her. So the lady politely folded up, rolled up the quilt and put it back. So she said she left that day and thought about it and kept thinking about it. And she wanted to ask more questions. So when she, before she, right before she left, she said, well, tell me more about it. And the lady said, Mrs. Ozella said, I will tell you when you are ready. You are not ready now. She, and, and Jacqueline Tobin did not quite understand what she was saying to her, but she kept that in mind. Three years later, she went back to that same market. And when she saw Mrs. Ozella, she was still sitting in the back with all her quilts. Ms. Ozella looked at her and said, you are now ready, come and I want to tell you my story. So Jacqueline Tobin, she said, and I want you to write it down. That is one of the controversies about, and one of the um, reasons why many scholars and many historians believe that this is just a fable, that quilts were used as secret codes to the Underground Railroad because nothing was ever documented. There was no, and when things are not written down, there is no credibility. But there's a lot of, when, when uh, 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 historians cannot make a, make a, when historians cannot go and find written histories and written facts about an event that has happened back in slavery, which we all know that things were not written down, things were not documented, then they tend to not believe it. One of the other things that I wanna highlight here is that the Africans that they brought over from Western coast, from the West and the Central Africa, they had, they 
in their particular tribes, they had traditions of writing down all, not writing down, but orally memorizing all of the history of their tribes. The, the documentation that they used was an oral storytelling method. And in each of the tribes, they had a person called a griot. He's the, he is the historian, the, the storyteller. And his job was to memorize the entire history of that tribe, the people, the events that occurred. And before he passes away, they find another griot. He tells to make sure that the next person that proceed, the person that's behind him, know the entire history of that tribe. So when the Africans came over on the slave ships, a lot of these, they came from different tribes. Most of them came from Western and Central Africa. They did the same tradition that they were used to. They memorized. They had sharp minds for names and numbers. And of course, it was illegal and forbidden to teach the slaves to read or write. Therefore, their memory was very important in memorizing things and telling things. And that's exactly what happened during the times of slavery. They had to memorize and they had to remember things, but it was their tradition to do that. You know, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but getting back to Miss Ozella Daniels, she told, uh, she had Jacqueline Tobin sit down on a pile of quilts and she looked at her, leaned forward and said to her, write this down. Now, Jacqueline Tobin was a white woman. She said it took her three years to even understand the slave uh, and the experience. She said she was very unfamiliar with what this lady was trying to say to her. So she realized that it took her three years to get ready to even understand what Ms. Ozella McDaniels was going to tell her. So let's go forward. This is the quilt that you saw on the wall. This is the sample quilt. And you would say, well, where did they get the fabric? This quilt is made out of 100% cotton, as I've said, and I've already stated that Karen gave me all of the, all of the fabric to make this quilt. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and this is, this is 15 blocks, but there's 10 main blocks and there's five or six that's not even represented here. These blocks, uh, or there's only a few that hand, were hand pieced, and I'll show you in a minute. How I made this quilt, how the slaves used to make their quilt from pieces of fabric that they saved. Uh, the mistress of the house would have old clothes. They would cut the, cut the clothes up and use it in, the, in their quilts. They also was trading back and forth from other plantations because they could visit sometimes other plantations and they would trade for pieces of fabric. They, in the late 18, in the mid 1800s, the beginning of the 1800s, the feed sack, sacks started to come with different uh, patterns and things on the feed sack. So they would cut that up and put it in the quilt. So you see the geometric shapes the, the squares, the circle, the stars, all of these are the symbols. And one of the things that the, the uh, Jacqueline Tobin and Mrs. Ozella Williams was trying to say that the reason the story was handed down to her, she got the story from her relatives and from her ancestors. She said that story had passed down in her family from generation to generation because she actually had slaves. She actually had a family members that took the Underground Railroad and went north to freedom. It was not written and it came down to her family too. So it's, it's not unusual even though this is called a American sampler quilt, these are traditional blocks because these are the blocks that the slaves learn how to quilt at this, at this time during the, uh, during the slave period. Using geometry, using the squares, 
the triangles, the circles are the same symbols that they used when they were in Africa. Because the textile designs in Africa had codes in them also. The cloth, they made cloth for weddings, deaths, celebrations, and rituals. Their fabric too, their block prints in Africa were encoded with all kinds of messages, even their carvings and their weavings all had encoded messages. So this technique of using blocks to, for direction and to encode secret messages was not new to the Africans. This is a hand piece block that I did that I actually put in this quilt. And their hand piece blocks would actually probably look just like this. Uh, they had to cut with whatever scissors, how dull they were or whatever. This is called a monkey wrench. The monkey wrench block is one of the most important blocks in this quilt. Because when they put out a, a quilt that had monkey wrench and it was hanging somewhere near the slave cabin, that means get yourself ready. The Underground Railroad is about to take off. This is one of the, this is the story that Miss Ozella Williams, which you have to memorize to learn to learn the different blocks and how to use them. So come along on this train with me. The story of the Underground Railroad. The slaves at night after they work would sit and the storyteller would sit and repeat this and have them repeat it every night. They would repeat this in order to learn it. It said, the monkey wrench turns the wagon wheel toward Canada. With help from Jesus, the carpenter followed the bear's trail through the woods. Fill your baskets with enough food and supplies to get you to the crossroads. Once you get to the crossroads, dig a log cabin in the ground. Shoe fly told us to dress up in cotton and satin bows and bow ties. Follow the flying geese and birds in the air. Stay on the drunken's path. Take the sailboat across the Great Lakes to the north above Canada. Now these are the basic blocks. There are other five or six other blocks. These blocks were indicative of where you lived. For instance, this bear claw block, which I would get to and I'll talk more about it. Certain blocks were not used in every, on every plantation. If you lived in the Appalachians, then there are certain blocks you would use in, their, in that quilt. If you lived over in Mississippi or Arkansas or Kentucky or on that side, there were certain blocks that you would use there. So let's go, let me go on. Now I'm only going to show you a few. I am not going to go through all 15 of these blocks. It's not necessary, necessary to do that. I want to just highlight a few of them and, and teach you now on this. Go with me now on this Underground Railroad. This is what some of these, some of the codes. This one says, the monkey wrench turns the wagon wheel on the bear's paw trail to the crossroad. What does that mean? When you saw the monkey wrench, now each of these quilts, they did not see this. This entire block here would be an entire quilt. The monkey wrench means this, the, the there it is. The monkey wrench block. This is the entire quilt. This quilt will be displayed. Then they know the, that, the, that you need to start getting ready. You need to start thinking about whether you want to go on the next train because it's coming, whether you're ready to, to run. The monkey wrench really symbolizes one of the most important people is the ironsmith. Uh, a monkey wrench is a tool that used to tighten the wagon wheels when they would get very, uh, you know, unstable on the wagon. So it was a very, it was a of the plantations. The, so the monkey, whoever was the ironsmith uh, was a very uh, important person. So they used that one. Uh, see what else I want to say about that monkey wrench. They would use that one as to pack up the tools you needed, the food you needed, 
make up your mind whether you're going because once you're on the underground railroad there was no turning back uh uh anything else that you needed some people get ready by putting your they used to take bandanas and cloth and put supplies that they need food that they need they were tied up and the next one that I want to show was the bear claw. The bear, the bear claw quilt was basically used in the Appalachians on that side where Harriet Tudman was. She was on the Eastern Maryland shore and they would have to go through the Appalachian mountains order to go to North. And as you know, some of you know, and some of you may not know that she made 19 trips to the South in order not only to free her family, her parents, as well as others. She freed about 300 from Maryland and about 60 from Baltimore, but totally she freed just, just under about a thousand people from eight, it says in history, from 800 to a thousand people. Of course, there's really no, no documented records of how many, but she did make 19 trips to the North. Now, why is this quilt? What's the code in this quilt? When you saw this quilt hanging, that means that uh, when you're on, on the run, usually there's cabins along the, the Appalachian Trail, right before you get to the mouth of the Appalachian Trail. Most slaves ran away. The perfect time to run away was in the spring because that's when the berries, the food was, the food was on the, you know, on the, like the berries and some of the other food was now in fruition. The mountains had give, had the, the snow started to melt on the mountains, therefore there was water. They used this because the bears always went to water in the Appalachians and they always went to the berries and where the food was. So the slaves would look down and find the bear tracks and follow that. Then they know they could find water and they could find food. A lot of times the slaves ran away when it was thundering and lightning. The lightning lit their way because they only could run at night. The lightning would light their way and also the rain would wash away their tracks. So it was very important when you first started to run to try to uh, cover yourself because as soon as they know you were gone, they would have the dogs out. Now, what do they do about those dogs? It's very interesting. They would, a lot of the slaves when they're running, if they could get their hand, they start accumulating pepper because the pepper would throw the, the dogs off their track. So they would accumulate the pepper and it takes a while because they didn't have it. So they'd have to just start getting pieces and getting pieces because they're now trying to get ready to run. And as they're running, they would throw out every now and then the pepper because they're trying to get to the river. They always ran where the water was because the water was always leading them away usually from where they, where they, were, uh, where they were living. This next one is called the crossroads. This quilt was put out when you've run so far until you would get to a certain place and it's a town. When you saw this quilt, it's used hanging. Um, they would hang them on a barn and I have a picture of one. They would hang them on a barn or they would hang them uh, on a fence post. Then you knew that you were near a town, some of, that you were almost free. Crossroad cities were like oh, Cleveland, Ohio, because it was on Lake Erie. Uh, Detroit, Michigan was a crossroad city. Uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was a crossroad city. There, that's where you could you could you could live as a fugitive and not be captured and go back until 1840. But uh, let's see, um, crossword cities were considered on particularly Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio, and Detroit, Michigan, on Lake Michigan. Uh, no, particularly Detroit, Michigan on Lake Erie, the men, were considered the ones that were going to go to Canada to take the books and the goods. And so they would use that as a secret code. Now, think about it. If it's a secret code and it's so hushed that only ab the abolitionists 
and the people that were sensitive to the cause knew the code, why would you want to write it down? I mean, there's a reason why it wasn't documented. There was a reason, like, Karen is a great historian. That's why she's a historian for our Weavers Guild. But it would be very hard for you to find evidence because the whole thing was word of mouth. It was secret. And only people who were sensitive, they had meetings in the middle of the night to pass the word along when things were, there was no documentation. The next set is once they got to the crossroads, they dug a log cabin on the ground. Shoe fly told them to dress up in cotton and satin bows. This is the log cabin, this is the shoe fly, and this is the satin bow quilt. The log cabin quilt is important because they would hang it on the barn, hang it on top of the house, and hang it on the fence. Remember the when, there, when this railroad was moving, there's three components of this railroad. The conductor was like a Harriet Tubman. They weren't always with them. Sometimes they would have to leave because of the forest where they were hiding. But the second person, the second part the train. There's three aspects of the train. The conductor, the passengers were the slaves, and then if you were a safe house, you would hang this quilt either on a roof, on a fence, or somewhere where the slaves could see it. Now this is traditional log cabin quilt block, which a lot of quilters are familiar with, but there's something different about this quilt. First of all, it had to be have a black center. Traditionally, this log cabin is made with a red center. I've made this block several times and I make it with a red center. But when it was a, when it was a log cabin to, to indicate that this was a safe house, it was made with a black center. So this, think about it. You're hiding, in the, you're hiding in the woods. You're waiting for signals. You finally, a woman comes out and she puts a quilt on the fence, but it has a red center. That's not a safe house. You had to know which quilt was the, was the code, was the secret code, was encoded with your direction. When she put that quilt, when another house put out a quilt, and it's a black center, then you know that's a safe house. Where you could get where you could get nourishment. Some of the slaves needed medical attention. Some of them needed whatever they needed. They ran with they also most they said that mostly a lot of men ran uh, because a lot of women they women also, and especially when it, when the train got near the early 1800s. Uh, so let's go to the next one. This is shoe fly. Shoe fly represents a person that is sympathetic to the slave cause. And that shoe fly is an actual person who is secret. And even though he's not a cutter or participating or has, okay. If you were sympathetic to the cause, then you would put this quote out somewhere near your home or where you work. And then the, then a, then the runaway could go and ask questions. Uh, where should we go next? Information. They also could help you if you are hurt or remember they were falling down as they were running. They're running through the thicket. Some of them need medical attention and some of them just need a place to rest. And so even if you weren't a part of the underground, but you knew that you were against slavery, then you would own a shoe fly quilt and put it out. And then they would know that uh, you were a safe person to approach. Okay, so that's what that quilt was for. Sometimes this quilt was displayed in the window of a hiding place uh, to, um, to help them. Okay, the next is, can you hear me? Yeah, the next three blocks, and I'm almost finished is the fine piece 
stay on the drunkard's path and follow the stars. I'll show you what those three mean. Okay, the flying geese. Uh, remember I told you that a lot of, most of, most of the time they ran away in spring? Well, the geese north, when they're in and so they're away from signals. They have to read cars, they have to read the, the uh, terrain they already are, because remember they don't write. Therefore, trying to continue to run at night to find the north was very difficult. So they used everything they could. So they were taught that if, when you see the flying geese, the geese were flying from the south to the north, flowed geese. The geese always was flying. The next one is the drunkard's path. Quilt. Uh, okay, so the next is the drunkard's path quilt, and the and the drunkard path quilt. Uh, uh, it means that the path is going to wind. After they saw the when they saw that quilt pattern, uh, you, a person that lived with a lady would tell them that this path is going to wind, or and it also taught them that when they're running, sometimes they back backtrack themselves. Don't run in a straight path because you're being chased under to learn what that's like and still figure I back to the north. So that, and I did a blue one. Can you get this blue one? I made a drunkard's path. Do I keep going? The final one. All right. Give me a minute, I don't know where I am. Okay, the North Star. Finally, there's some things that they use for the North Star. You're familiar with a lock here. This block here. Nope. This block here is the North Star. This block here was the drunken path. The drunken path. Learn to meander in the woods, but keep your eye on the North Star. This block, yeah, this is a drunken path. This means meander, but keep yourself watching the sky. This one means that when you get to a crossroad city, when you get to a crossroad city, look for this particular sailboat. This would be on the side of a ship, or it would be a flag flying on a pole on a boat, or it would be a near house that lived near a river or near on the lake, a lake area or the lake that you're going to take to Canada. This block, they had to learn that this star can be found at the end of a drinking gourd. The drinking gourd was a symbol that was in the sky. It actually was the Big Dipper. And at the end of the tip of the Big Dipper at the bottom was the beginning of the Little Dipper. Well, the North Star was at the tip. That's where the song, follow the drunken gourd. That's where that, so they were cotton field. They would go and that someone would teach them how to read the stars in the sky. They could locate the, the that they know that they to put on their signals. They have followed the geese. Then they found the northern star. Star. They would take the boat to Canada. To end this, I really need a picture of my. This is the picture of our drunken path. This is the picture of my drunken path. This is the picture. Now, these are variations in that quilt. Go back to my quilt. All right, I made this. And so this gives even a close up of how the, tri how the circles uh, meander in that quilt. That quilt is about 70 inches by 70 inches by 85 is a very, very large quilt. This is the star quilt. When you have made it north, you're clear in the area. This could be hanging by these house or fence or display. And all the blocks are not the same. 
this one has a very Asian feel. She is plain one, and this is one more like mine. I just want to show you variations in quilts. This is the last one I want to show you because we have a grill. Remember I said the grill, the griot, some say grill, some say griot, depends on where you are in Africa. I had a griot in my family. And before we click off again, my griot in my family was, our, I actually got passed down slave stories, stories of my ancestors and my heritage as a slave in Alabama. This is my Aunt Del Williams. She was born in 1920. And I sat at her feet and she shared the stories with me before she passed away just a couple of few years ago. I am so thankful that, I, that eventually I will pass down. I'm beginning to tell, tell some of my relatives and some of the, um, the ones that were listening, because we are in the 21st, in the, in the, you know, whoever would want to to find the griot who will pass my stories down. Now, uh, I am so thankful that I have my ancestors' history as a slave in uh, during slavery times and the life that they led in Alabama during slavery. My people came around the mid 1700s. So she took me back the mid to late 1700s and gave me stories of my great, great, great aunt and some of the other slavery. I, Constance Black Lee, and I want to thank you for listening. You have any We are coming up to the edge of our time. We can go a little bit over if anybody has any questions they want to ask. For Anybody have any questions? Uh, if you have questions, go right ahead. And for questions, you can either unmute yourself to ask a question or you can put it in no the questions. chat box and I'll read it off. I'm Beverly here. Uh, I don't really have a question. Sure. I don't know if you got my chat or not, Megan. I'm not. Even. I didn't. Sure. Okay. One from you. I I don't know how to send it yet, but um, the Weavers of Orlando want to know want you to know that there is so much more, and we had trouble narrowing our information down. We hope this gets you interested in your ancestry and your artistry and where it came from. I also want everybody to know that Lake Mary History Museum will have Constance Blackman Lee's quilt on display in January, 2021 and some of her other work. And I want you to be the first to know we're trying to get out there even though we're stuck inside. Thank you, Beverly. And it's going to be amazing to be able to Thanks, see Constance's work. Well, it's the cotton that they talked about. The one that, you know, that enslaved people used to. And, and then Jennifer talked about how the, the tied to the ancestry with the cotton is king was the word in the South. And to see the same cotton transition to set people free, it was used also as an encoded material, the same fiber to, uh, to, their, to realize their own freedom. So cotton is still working, Jennifer. <laughs> We're still connected to that cotton. Yes, we still okay. are, all of us. Yes. We're still 
connected to the cotton. But I am so thankful that I have my stories now. I am the griot in the family. And you know what I'm going to do? Not only am I going to make a picture of some of the stories my aunt Della told me, she's wanting to write it down. Karen, I'm going to write it down, document what she has shared with me about Alabama slaves. If we don't have additional questions from the audience, we're a little over time, so we should start wrapping this up. I want to thank everybody for presenting. This has been just some absolutely amazing and almost mind-blowing information, history that we don't necessarily hear about in our schooling. So being able to share this is fantastic. Thank you so, for having us. Thank you so much for having us. This was a pleasure. Thank you everyone. And hopefully we get to see you all again next year, maybe even in person for Diversity Week. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.